Intel's Core 2 Quad is a legendary series that I haven't really dabbled about with on its own other than when it's included in a system. The question is now, 15 years later, how well do they hold up? Right, so while we get this little test system thrown together, why don't we talk a little bit about what makes the Core 2 Quad series as legendary as people say it is. I'm going to be testing three of its main iterations here, the legendary Q6600, the common OEM Q8200, and the often overlooked Q9450, all great chips in their own regard, but also the three most common chips, at least over here in the UK and also over in the US. So what is the story here? What is behind these three chips? Well, why don't we start with the Q6600? Released in early January of 2007, it quickly became the staple quad-core choice for those wanting a little bit more grunt than the Core 2 Duo series. It mostly followed on from the praise of AMD's tri-core processors, where most reviewers couldn't notice too many improvements to gaming and general tasks, but that's because games and general tasks of the era were still very heavy on the first two cores. I mean, we're in 2022, and even now, most games are still just hammering on four cores. So it was sort of like that era we're in today, where you're only buying the extra cores because you're doing more than gaming. Either way, what it meant was for gaming you still had loads of headroom, and that's something that's very important for testing today, because as I just said, a lot of games even today are only still hammering 4 cores. But given all this headroom back in the day, it was a beast for rendering tasks and the rise of multitasking, which gave it huge improvements over the competing processors. You could now run Crisis and talk to the boys on TeamSpeak with very little performance loss. In fact, you'd likely see no performance loss because Crisis wasn't touching your other two cores. Long story short, it was never a necessity to have a Core 2 Quad, but you can guarantee that everyone wanted one. But it wasn't cheap. It launched at $850 US dollars and quickly reduced itself to around $500 US dollars a few months later to make it more approachable to people and to boost sales a tad, as you either had to be multitasking or thinking of the future quite a lot when you bought one. As the years went on, the Core 2 Quad formula was watered down for OEMs, as Quad Cores were remarkably easy to market. I'm definitely sure I'm not the only one that remembers every advert, regardless of how good or bad the product was, made use of the Quad Core name. I even remember wireless routers would advertise Quad Core, Quad Band, all this kind of nonsense that was completely irrelevant to the product, but it had Quad Core in there, so it was suddenly better than everything else. Either way, the Q6600 was sold at a reduced rate to OEMs with plenty of Dell and HPs now offering you a Q6600 for little more than their launch price, which was rather compelling considering you got a full system included. And that of course means that lots of these systems are now available on eBay for a very cheap price if you did want to get into the world of Core 2 Quads. Then of course you had the Q8200 which cut the cash, cut the price and very similarly was mostly used by OEMs at a lower price point. Similar performance and a few modernised tweaks but ultimately I find the Q8200 a tad underwhelming. But as you'd expect, when they released this, they didn't just release the cost cut Q8200. No, it went far better than that and we reached the ultimate of the Core 2 Quad series with the 9000 series, in this case the Q9450. It was sort of all the improvements they'd made on moving from 65 nanometers to 45 nanometers, but without cutting anything out like they had to do with the Q8200. So today, what's the difference and how do the specs of these here three chips change? Now this right here is the primary focus of the video, with Intel's original Core 2 Quad Q6600, as I will be touching on the other parts later, but let's recap on what happened in the dawn of 2007. Its specs today are still nothing to scoff at, with 4 cores clocking in at 2.4GHz on the Kentfield 65nm node. It comes complete with 8MB of L2 cache, full 64-bit support, and it also comes complete with, you know, sort of just everything you'd need to expect it to run fine 15 years in the future. The only bit that lets it down is lacking SSE extensions, with no real support for SSE 4.1, something that does actually work with later Core 2 Quad chips. Today these processors are very cheap, I picked this one up in a full system for a tenner, with that often being the easiest way to get a hold of them, that or you can get them standalone for a very similar price on eBay, CEX or AliExpress. 
Comparing all three of the processors though, the Core 2 Quad Q6600 mostly boasts tape overclocking as its one advantage. It generally serves as being sort of a brute force solution to Core 2 quads, where it can sort of just power through based on raw power and specifications. Performance wise though, there shouldn't be a great deal of difference between the Q8200, Q9450 and the Q6600 as there's not a great deal of difference specs wise. Mostly the Q8200 serves as an optimised alternative to the 6600 and the Q9450 should pull ahead slightly due to the fact that it's the latest release and isn't cut down at all, yet is still an optimised version in a sense. So the entire legacy of the Core 2 Quad is up in the air and all that really remains is to get them all tested. Now as you probably noticed I've been working on this little system here which is actually a Dell Inspiron 530 which seems to really like these Core 2 Quad processors and allows them to operate well within their stock parameters. I have also tested with an equivalent gigabyte board that I also used in my Core 2 Duo video but with all that out the way what we're actually testing with here regardless of motherboards are 8 gigabytes of DDR2 as well as an R9 Fury and also my RTX 3050 for a few of the tests that require RTX. The RTX cards I will say though did require me to use the Dell Inspiron motherboard as RTX cards do not like a lot of LGA 775 equipment and even on the Inspiron they were a tad funny. They would post the system three times before the actual graphics card would be recognised by the Dell. However in terms of actually allowing me to test RTX tests on a Core 2 Quad it's the only way I was able to do it. But still how does the Core 2 Quad hold up when we throw all these chips into the benchmarks? Now I decided to start off the benchmarks quite hard with Red Dead Redemption 2 as there's not going to be any of that normal testing Gary's mod or Half-Life 2 nonsense as what's the point in doing that? We already know it can run those types of games. Either way, starting off the Q9450 was actually able to achieve nearly playable frame rates and this is of course with no need for any workarounds, the same that also went for the Q8200. The Q6600 of note though did need an SSE workaround just to start the game, completely disabling any ability to play the game online. Although mostly unplayable on anything other than the highest end 9450, all three processors could see north of 30fps in rather simple scenes, but for where the action actually started, only the final of the Core 2 quads was able to return anything near a playable frame rate. GTA 5 on the other hand saw all three chips performing pretty well and even the Q6600 was able to beat out one of its newer counterparts. Often all the processors hovered around 40fps or higher leading to a very playable experience. Of course intensive settings like AMD CHS Shadows or the Nvidia equivalent would completely tank the frame rate, but in general with middling settings in a 1080p resolution and DirectX 11 there is nothing stopping you playing GTA 5 both online or in single player on the Core 2 Quad in 2022. Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord is still surprisingly intensive even with lower settings selected. However with this configured right down to have the absolutely minimal battle sizes available we were actually able to play through some of the early game relatively easily and even the late game battles were playable provided you sort of had a trickle of enemies coming towards you, you had to have the battle size down that low. Either way it was only that really the Q8200 that felt noticeably slower than the other chips and it often suffered with stuttering where the others could maintain a smooth frame rate. So if you've got a Q6600 or a Q9450 even Mountain Blade Bannerlord is playable on these processors. Minecraft RTX was a bit of a pain in the ass to load in across all three of the processors, with both the Q8200 and Q9450 crashing numerous times before getting in game, something that wasn't present on the oldest Q6600, but either way whenever chunks were loading in across all three of the processors it was very unsmooth, it took a while for the chunks to actually render, however once everything had loaded in all three of the processors remain very playable between 40 and 60 FPS on all of the chips. I wouldn't exactly call it the smoothest experience as Java was certainly a lot smoother on these processors but it did remain perfectly playable, something quite impressive for an RTX title. Star Wars Fallen Order refused to even launch on the Q6600, likely once again due to the lack of instruction sets and unfortunately I don't really know any workarounds for this game to get it running, an issue we didn't actually run into on the two later chips. Not that it was much good on the Q8200 which was returning an FPS average of just over 20 the majority of the time. 
Although the Q9450 surprisingly powered through offering us 33 FPS on average, something that's actually on par with current gen consoles like the Xbox One, and that is surprising to say the least. BeamNG ran almost in parity between the Q6600 and the final Q950, however being very cash heavy in most instances, it did leave the Q8200 trailing behind once again, which seems to be something that's happened quite a few times already. And it wasn't the worst performance across any three of the processors, but those cost cutting measures 14 years ago have not been kind to the Q8200, unlike its fully fledged counterparts. Quake 2 RTX ran about the same across the board. It was of course very smooth on all of these systems, with the main thing actually taking its toll being the RTX effects, which do actually have some impact on the processor performance, especially when you're using one from 15 years ago. Still, it was interesting to see that the Q6600 and the Q8200 returned virtually the same frame rate when benchmarked against each other, with the 9450 pulling ever so slightly in front. The MasterChef collection was also a genuine surprise. I couldn't get Halo Infinite working at all on these processors, but I'm sure at some point in the future someone might come up with a workaround to at least get it to launch. In the meantime though, Greg Wallace's favourite title will run at near 60fps on all three of the processors when using the default settings in 1080p. There are of course frame drops under heavy action, but during the firefight game mode with plenty of AI being rendered on screen in a limited map space, it was a more than fluent experience. The same also extended to online play, with only slightly worse performance than this in most instances. CSGO is worth benchmarking just because it gets updated quite a lot, and we all know it is harder to run than it was 10 years ago. And I found the results a tad underwhelming when testing the casual deathmatch and the workshop benchmark, with neither of the three chips really returning a very promising experience. It was more than playable for a casual experience in mind, but even in competitive instances, when I did try a competitive match, you wouldn't see much more frame rates than what we were seeing in the casual deathmatch and the workshop benchmark. Meaning that unfortunately, even in a competitive scenario, you will not be seeing a competitive experience on either three of the Core 2 quad chips. Then of course to round us off with, can it run Crisis? Pause for dramatic effect. Remastered! Well that Q6600 couldn't in any regard, but the remaining two chips could actually provide some sort of an experience if you used a few little workarounds to get the game to launch, which likely hampered the performance down quite a bit. Even the best of the three could only muster sub 20 FPS, and this wasn't really under any intensive scenes. A real shame though, but it is still running Crisis Remastered. So 15 years later, the Core 2 Quad technically can still run Crisis. Now that we've got gaming all out of the way though, in terms of general usage, all of the Core 2 quad chips did really well, with the order of snappiness, if that's even a benchmark term, going Q9450, followed by the Q6600, and then right at the bottom, the Q8200, feeling noticeably slower than the rest due to that smaller amount of cash. It did just sort of fill up utilization a little bit more than the others. Video playback across the board though was very smooth, and the same goes for virtually everything being, you know, more than smooth, other than the Q8200 that might take a second or so longer than the rest to actually catch up. Even multitasking went really well, right up until you started to do heavy multitasking like gaming and watching YouTube. I even did a few performance comparisons where I tried loading up the budget build Discord on one side and then some basic gaming on the other, and there was definitely a decrease in performance across the board. But even today, as long as you aren't going to be trying to, you know, run Discord and Red Dead Redemption at the same time, you'll be fine. The Core 2 Quad is definitely able to play those simple games and run Discord, or TeamSpeak if you're still feeling like you're living in the mid 2000s, absolutely fine. I was actually still really impressed by the usability. So if you don't mind playing simple games, you can still do plenty of multitasking and gaming on a 15 year old processor. And no matter how you cut that, no matter what Core 2 Quad you use, that is still impressive. Given the sheer impact of this series though, I decided to turn to the Budget Builds community to see what their thoughts and opinions on the Core 2 Quad series was. And I was genuinely inundated with responses and plenty of people showing off their frankly amazing LGA775 builds, which they had running today, some people with overclocked processors and even with water cooling, some OEM and some all custom. 
but plenty of people had a lot to say about this series. Some people even using them till very recently, so thank you very much to everyone who took part and thank you very much for sharing your stories of the Core 2 Quad, as I really wanted to share other people's opinions on the processor series, as it certainly does help hit home the impact these processors actually had on people for the last 15 years, which in no way is a short amount of time. I suppose one final area to touch on would be the temperatures and actual support of the series, which remains pretty decent. Other than the oldest Core 2 Quad Q6600, I didn't have all too many issues launching games and programs on the Q9450. Yes, they could be a little bit slow, but generally we had enough instruction sets to actually power through a lot of modern programs and actually get them started. In terms of temperatures as well, well, this is actually quite a while before Intel started using TIM, which is like thermal paste inside the processor, so all these chips are soldered, leading to some very decent temperatures even with just using a stock LGA775 cooler from a Dell PC. I did also give the processor one last hurrah of an attempt to do some recording with OBS, so with some X264 recording in OBS, we actually saw some admirable quality results, you just had to stick to simple games that weren't going to eat through all your cores when you needed the remaining cores to actually do the recording for you. So in conclusion, Intel's Core 2 Quad. It is unironically still lingering on and actually still usable, and as much as I really don't want to recommend this line of processors 15 years on, if you actually still have one and you're still being forced to use it today, well maybe things aren't as bleak as some people paint them out to be. You know, eventually I will be covering something to finalise this trilogy as we've got the Core 2 Duos covered, we've now got the Core 2 Quads covered, so I will eventually be covering the Extreme Chips and the Xeons in the final of my LGA 775 trilogy. So so to see the final offerings of the platform, at least from a Core 2 Quad perspective in this video, is very impressive. And I'm not going to go and say, go out and buy one, these are brilliant, because that would be completely pointless. These are 15 year old processors. But when you look at it that way, a decade and a half old processor series still being able to hold their own in some very modern and intensive titles. And while that is still very impressive, it is just admirable. There's no other way to cut it. I don't think I've ever seen a processor hold up as well as the Core 2 Quad has. So thank you very much for watching and good night.